Listen, yeah, it's the festive period. We're doing a festive weirdest episodes. I love Christmas. You possibly love Christmas. Bret Hart loves Christmas. So what better way to celebrate than by looking at a wrestling show around Christmas time where Bret Hart's in the main event? In the wise words of Prince, tonight we're going to produce wrestling YouTube content like it's 1999. December 19th, 1999 to be exact. And that means it's time for Starcade 99. Oh yes, WCW again, guys. Let's quickly look at the wrestling landscape around this time. Like we're still in the midst of the Monday Night Wars, but it's going pretty badly now for WCW. 99 has been a disastrous year for the company, to be honest. They've gone from still competing with the WWF in the ratings to now by the end of the year totally lagging behind and getting destroyed week in week out so they've made some changes behind the scenes one major change is that they've gotten rid of eric bischoff but if you've seen some of my episodes covering wcw in the year 2000 you'll know that he's back before too long but if you thought that a lack of Eric Bischoff in this episode meant a lack of chaos and frustration, don't you worry, because we've got Vince Russo. Yes. Vince Russo for the uninitiated is, of course, the writer who propelled WWF, in his own opinion, I guess, past WCW in the ratings wars by introducing this brand of car crash, Jerry Springer-inspired wrestling television. Sounds good, right? Wrong. Many, many people have said before that Vince Russo's issue kicked over my water bottle. Good start. Luke, cut out the water bottle bit. I'm losing, I'm losing my mind. Okay. Many, many people have said before that Vince Russo's main problem as a wrestling booker and writer is that he has a million ideas and only a few of them are any good. But they're really good ideas. You just need to filter out a lot of crap to get there. That worked in WWF when he was very much under the thumb of Vince McMahon. But in WCW now in 99 with free reign, it's not quite smooth sailing. This is Weirdest Episodes, and it's time to look at Starcade 1999. Uh, yeah. Take a look around, everybody. We are in Washington, D.C., the home of the Half Smoke Hot Dog, the home of actual wrestling fan Wale, and the home of sweet, sweet American freedom. And what's that? There are 13 matches on this card. Let's get going. Match number one, we are straight into the action. And the tagline for Starcade 99 is the battle to end the millennium. And what better way to look forward into the new millennium than with Disco, Disco Inferno to be precise. Oh dear. Disco Inferno is of course the guy off of Twitter who likes to talk about how everything in modern wrestling is terrible and bad and then gets dunked on by people including Cody Rhodes. If you just show that tweet there, Luke, that's, ooh, that is a, ooh, a savage sting burn. He is teaming with Lash LaRue against the Mamelukes, Johnny the Bull and Big Vito. It sounds like a standard undercard tag team match. It is not. The story here is that Disco Inferno owes money to the goddamn mafia, yo. So yeah, Disco owes $25,000 to the Marinara family. Uh, so Tony Marinara, that is literally the ring name they've given him, has sent Big Vito and Johnny the Bull to beat up Disco and get that money back. Why is Lash LaRue involved? I don't know. Um, he's a nice guy. People like him. He's easy to get along with. Maybe that is why in the near future he will be invited to join the Misfits in action. I seem to do that every video now. Unfortunately, there's not a great deal to report from the match itself. The heels get on top early. The baby faces make their comeback. The ending's very weird though. Disco gets whipped chest first into the corner. He bounces back. They then throw Lash LaRue into him, but Disco can't see that it's his own tag team partner. So like a prime Randy Orton, he instinctively hits his finisher. Unfortunately, of course, he's hit it on his own tag partner. And even more unfortunately, the finisher that Disco has picked is the most over finisher in the business, the Stone Cold Stunner, which comes across as really cheap. And also he doesn't really do it as well as Steve. So it's quite awkward. Anyway, this leads to the bad guys picking up the win. Then afterwards, they all beat up Disco some more, zip him into a body bag, and just carry him off. And the tone from the announced team is weird. They're all very casual about it. They're like, well, looks like Disco might be sleeping with the fishes tonight. How very blase. But it's not over yet, right? <laughs> oh man, because they, they take Disco backstage through the curtain, they unzip the body bag, they beat him up some more, then they drag him over to a car and they put him in the trunk of a car and they all drive off with him. 
That, that's the craziest Ryan I've ever seen. They've had two ideas there, haven't they? Like either put him in a body bag or we could put him in a car. Just do one of those two ideas. Just put him in the car while he's in the body bag even. Next up, a bit of breaking news from the announced team who tell us that uh, Scott Hall unfortunately is injured. He can't defend his United States Championship tonight, but instead of vacating the belt, they've just awarded it to the man that he was supposed to face. And that man is, oh, that man's Chris Benoit. Benoit comes out for a promo where he's like, yo guys, basically, <laughs> Benoit doesn't, <laughs> Benoit's all like, yo guys, how's it hanging, Chrissy B here. No, but seriously, Benoit's like, yes, I may be now the US champion, but I think titles should be fought for, not just awarded arbitrarily. So I'm issuing an open challenge for later on tonight, and if anybody wants to come and try and win this title from me, then feel free. And honestly, I agree with pretty much everything Chris Benoit said in this promo. I agree with Chris Benoit. Mm. Next up, Evan Courageous is defending his newly won Cruiserweight Championship and is accompanied by his rather new girlfriend as well. She's one of the Nitro girls. She's also one of the ingredients used to make the Powerpuff Girls. It's Spice. I don't know much about Spice, to be fair, but I did find her page on prowrestling.fandom.com and that has a quote from Spice which says, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bull. And that's essentially how I made a career on YouTube, so I'm rooting for you, Spice. Evan is taking on Medusa, also known, of course, as Alundra Blaze, uh, a pioneer, a legendary figure in women's wrestling, a very important historical figure as well, but unfortunately, someone whose career since has kind of been boiled down to that woman who threw the belt in the bin on, on Nitro. Now, the story in the background of this match is that Evan was dating Medusa, but now his wandering eye has led him to ditch Medusa and start going out with the younger Spice. I was rooting for you, Spice, and now I find out that you and Evan are the villains of the piece. How very dare you. Evan and Spice have a little kissy on the outside and Medusa's like, I'm having none of that. She starts taking it to her slimy love rat ex. I'm really, I'm, <laughs> turns out I'm really into this storyline. At one point they are face to face in the ring and Medusa goes, go on then, hit me then Evan. Evan goes, wow, like actually drops her as well. And on commentary, there's no sympathy at all. Even though Medusa's the baby face, they're all like, well, you want to be a wrestler? Let's see what you got, kid. By this point, Medusa had already won titles in the AWA, the WWF, and All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling, and Evan was about two years into his wrestling career, so... Yeah. But despite his relative lack of experience, Evan Courageous is clearly a bit of a natural, like he looks at home in the ring. At one point, he even hits a gorgeous set-out powerbomb. It's really nice. And then Medusa, who I've just defended as being more experienced than Evan and, you know, not getting the credit she deserves in wrestling, almost murders him with a really terrifying powerbomb of her own. He almost lands on his head. Thankfully, he doesn't. Evan retakes control of the match after surviving almost certain death. Uh, and then, just as he's about to win, Spice gets on the apron. And she wants another little kissy. <laughs> Sounds so weird, man. But yes, yeah, she wants another little kissy. Evan goes over and it's all a ruse because while he's distracted, Medusa slaps him across the back. And then Spice hits the worst low blow I have maybe ever seen. It's also really unique. I've never quite seen a low blow like it. In wrestling, there tends to be two kinds of low blows, doesn't there? Either a kick from the front or like an uppercut from the back. This one's an uppercut from the front and it like doesn't even, clearly doesn't even do anything. Like Evan has to like sell it late. He doesn't quite realize it's happened. It's just all a bit of a mess. Medusa German suplexes Evan Courageous, one, two, three, and she becomes, to be fair, this is quite cool, the first ever female cruiserweight champion in history. Although not the only one because I believe Daphne and Jacqueline will go on to do so as well. Spice leaves with Medusa and the whole way as they're leaving, Spice is pulling this face like, <laughs> well, guess you didn't see that coming. This has been a setup all along. And I'm like, yeah, we already know that Spice. We've taken that on board. You don't need to pull the sneaky face. We literally saw you punch your boyfriend in the cock. Evan Courageous would go on to be in three count, of course, the wrestling boy band, while Medusa would go on to be a pioneering figure in the world of monster trucks. No, <laughs> like seriously. Backstage we go now because mean Gene Oakland is interviewing Norman Smiley. Genuinely, what a combination that is. Norman is getting ready to defend his hardcore championship against Meng, but he gets a fright when a guy behind the camera makes a sudden movement and he asks Gene, did I, did I soil myself? And mean Gene, totally deadpan, just looks at Smiley and goes, you did. I think Mean Gene is an underrated shout for maybe the funniest person in wrestling history. That match is next, and the story here is that Meng is one of the most legitimately terrifying and hard men in all of wrestling history, and Norman Smiley is not. Norman arrives wheeling a bin full of bins. 
exhibit would have something to say about that. Oh, pimp my right. Um, we put a thing in your thing so you can game while you get. Is that an old meme? Is that has that died out now? I I remember it. Hooked you up with the real deal right out of this exhaust. <laughs> But yes, Norman arrives wheeling a bin full of bins. He throws one of the bins into the ring and Men catches the bin and, and uses the bin to bat away the other bins that Norman's throwing into the ring. Yes, yeah, that, that's what happened. They battle backstage and Meng just no-sells various weapon shots, like nothing's working on him. Uh, Norman counters this by screaming in terror, which doesn't work. And then at one stage, check this out, Meng tries to, I think, legitimately kill Norman Smiley by throwing a cinder block into his head. Mercifully, he gets out of the way. That is not a spot I would have agreed to do, because if you mistime that, it's game over. But suddenly the match is ruined by interference because Meng is jumped by Fit Finley and Brian Nobbs. Finley because he loves to fight and Brian Nobbs because he's like Finley's little lackey at the moment. So I guess he loves to fight too. Maybe not quite as much. Meng continues to no-sell just so many weapons. It's actually class. Uh, he no-sells everything until finally Finley takes him down with a lead pipe shot to the back. Uh, Norman Smiley makes the pin, runs away, and then Meng wakes up and chokes out the referee. One of my favorite matches of all time. To the locker room area we go where David Flair receives a gift. It's a golden crowbar. That's because he's got a crowbar on a pole match later on, but it doesn't make sense because the crowbar is going to be up on a pole. So that's the one that both guys are going to be trying to get. So why is he being given a crowbar now? It just totally renders the whole stipulation redundant. I hate WCW. I'll correct myself there. I hate 1999 WCW. I hate latter day. WCW. It had great moments throughout its history. I'm not trying to not trying to diss, you know, one of the most iconic wrestling promotions of all time. Hacksaw Jim Duggan's next, and he's he's taking on the revolution, and he's gonna be joined by three mystery partners. Let's let's dig down into this because I, I feel like I might have just said a bit of waffle there. First of all, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, we all know him. He loves America, America loves him, he loves planks of wood, you know, oh, he's a great hero and everything. Won the first ever Royal Rumble match. Jim Duggan. Now in WCW, even better, Vince Russo has made him a janitor. The Revolution are a heel stable led by Shane Douglas. They also comprise of Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, and a female bodybuilder named Asia. Asia is basically WCW's answer to China, but if you've noticed, they've done something really clever there with the names because Asia's a whole continent. It's bigger than just the nation of China. It's kind of like if WWE in this war with AEW brought in a guy called like Judas Jerusalem or Benny Alpha. That's really good. I'm really good. The story of the revolution as a heel stable, it starts off quite simple. Like basically they started off as under, it's like the classic tale of underappreciated real workers on the undercard who aren't getting a shot at the main event scene that they desperately crave. But now under Russo, they've not just rebelled against WCW management, they've also rebelled against the government and America and they've, they're calling themselves their own nation and they've got their own flag and stuff. It's weird. It's like something from Fallout, although I've never played those games, but I did, I did during lockdown, right? I watched so much Fallout. Let's Plays on YouTube. I, it was a sad time, man. And now because they hate America so much, they have to take on the essence of America itself, Jim, Jim Duggan. They cut a heel promo in the ring. Shane Douglas gets on the mic and cuts a promo so average that at one stage, Dean Malenko has to come over and give him a little hug to be like, it's okay, mate, you're, you're doing all right. Duggan comes out and reveals his mystery partners, Mike Rotunda, Kevin Sullivan, and Rick Steiner, the Varsity Club. They're an amateur wrestling gripply grap stable from the old mid-Atlantic days, so it's really nice to see WCW give a nod to its own history, but at the same time, this live crowd in 99 in Washington, DC, really don't seem to care about these old fellas with their glistening legs and their merch that says where they went to university. Like, ooh, I went to Michigan 25 years ago. Grow up. No offense to the University of Michigan there, although I am obviously Ohio State for life. I don't know, I did a, I did a Google. So the crowd aren't really into the Varsity Club, but what they are into is America, and they just rain down USA chants throughout this match while Jim Duggan beats up the heels and then beats them up some more, and then continues to beat them up some more. He doesn't tag out once. Eventually the heels start using heelish tactics, and that's enough for the Varsity Club, who storm the ring and beat all the heels up, and then also beat up Jim Duggan, their own tag team partner, because he wasn't tagging out to them. It's storytelling, it's psychology, it's wrestling. 
The brawl spills to the outside of the ring, Duggan is left down and Shane Douglas, the ultimate opportunist, he runs inside and pins Duggan for the cheap victory for the Revolution. This win would also mean that the next night on Nitro, uh, the Revolution would try to make Duggan renounce his faith in America and, and the American flag and all that sort of stuff. And Duggan says no. But then shortly after this, he would in fact join Team Canada at one point. So it's always the ones you least suspect. Backstage, we learn that Oklahoma has been kidnapped by innovative pioneering horror punk band The Misfits. I gather that's a sentence that needs a bit of context. Oklahoma is a Jim Ross parody character played by a man named Ed Ferrara, who for all intents and purposes is like Vince Russo's sidekick. He jumped over from WWF to WCW. He's a writer, but also he's playing this Oklahoma role. JR himself later said that he found this portrayal quite offensive and insulting, and with good reason, because it's crap. Anyway, that's Oklahoma. He's managing Dr. Death Steve Williams at the moment, who JR also managed at one point in the WWF. Uh, the Misfits are the band The Misfits. You know the ones, the ones with the, the skull logo? I'm not too familiar with The Misfits. They're the New Jersey punk band. They like horror films and that. Like, apparently they're important in the history of punk. To, to me, punk rock started with the release of Green Day's Dookie, so I'm, I'm a heathen. Do you have the time to live? So they're helping, the Misfits that is, they're helping Vampiro because he's a goth boy as well. They're goth boys, all the, all the goth boys together. Come on, the goths. They all head to ringside with Oklahoma in a cage because the stipulation here is that if Vampiro can beat Dr. Death Steve Williams, he gets five minutes alone in a match with Oklahoma. It's a classic case of the slimy heel manager getting his comeuppance. But the annoying thing is that Oklahoma, despite being in a cage and being terrified that Vampiro is going to win and get to beat him up, He's still got his headset on so he can commentate this match as it goes on. And, you know, despite it being quite offensive for various reasons, the, the impression of JR is also just not that good. And he does it like, I don't know who found this funny, probably Ed Ferrara and Russo themselves, but it's just, it's just not good. There's not much to report from the match itself. It goes how you'd kind of expect. Vampiro's doing the, the punches and the kicks, and Steve Williams is doing the suplexes and the slams. Uh, there is a terrifying high spot, though, later on. They go up top, right to the top, and there's a terrifying overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex. Vampiro nearly lands, like, right on the top of his head, almost. He just rolls through in time, but I hope Luke gets a good screenshot of it because it, it's, it's silly. The Misfits all rush the ring. They are not trained wrestlers, by the way. It's not very good. Uh, Dr. Death Steve Williams is bravely fighting the them all off on his own and I'm like what like he's the bad guy but he's overcoming all these he's like he's like bloody John Cena now he's taking care of all the interference Dr. Death sees Vampiro he gets on top of him sick ground and pound from the mount position yo and if the interference of New Jersey's beloved punk band the Misfits isn't enough for the DQ then not getting off at the referee's insistence and shoving him away certainly is that's the wacky world of WCW so Steve Williams gets DQ'd and Vampiro gets the win a group of security guard dads get in the ring and they are checked out. They're just collecting a paycheck. Look at these blokes in their, in their jeans. They, are not, they don't want to be there. They usher Steve Williams away and it's time for Vampiro's match with Oklahoma. In a move that I believe Kenny Omega himself would do on the indies about 20 years later, Oklahoma, with the headset on, commentates his own match. Now it's worth noting that Vampiro's just been beaten down by Steve Williams, so he is weakened, which explains, I guess, why Oklahoma batters him <laughs> in the early going. He hits a stiff kick to the chest and a massive DDT. It's like strong, this is strong, this is what Inoki meant. When he, when he pioneered strong style wrestling. Vampiro eventually starts his comeback. No, he doesn't because TV writer Ed Ferrara cuts him off with a kick to the inner thigh like AJ Styles does sometimes. Although if there was any wrestler I could compare Oklahoma's style to here, it probably wouldn't be AJ Styles. He seems to have the same moveset as Katsuyori Shibata and I think you would all agree probably. Vampiro finally makes his comeback and then all the misfits get in the ring and they all help Vampiro beat Oklahoma down and then Vampiro pins him for the win. And the crowd, the crowd don't even care. Like, I guess it's like, ooh, the heel manager's finally gotten his just desserts and everything, but it's also like, why would you care about this Oklahoma bloke? And why would we care that the misfits are randomly involved? Would we care, for example, if Slipknot helped Bray Wyatt beat up Paul Heyman? Actually, yeah, that sounds awesome. 
Next up, mate, look at this image. This is our resident heel authority figure aligned stable of 1999 in WCW, because we need one at every point in wrestling history, apparently. It is the amazing combination of Kurt Hennig, the Harris brothers, Virgil, and La Parker. Oh my God. They're in a meeting with the person who kind of is in charge of them, this shadowy off-screen figure called the powers that be, which is clearly Vince Russo. But the most insulting thing about this isn't that we're meant to be like, I wonder who this off-screen figure is when it's it's got Russo's voice. It's obviously Vince Russo. No, the most insulting thing is that we're actually, I think, meant to be like, oh my God, it's Vince Russo. WCW is about to get awesome. That's, that's an insult. Also, Russo buries them, his own lackeys. He's like, yeah, guys, I can't really talk to you tonight. Like, good luck with your matches and <laughs> whatnot. Um, and he's just bored. You can hear his voice off camera. just sounds bored when he's talking to them. They all head off. Russo's reason for not paying attention to them is because something big is going down tonight. We'll find out what that is in the main event. And as all the guys walk off, I'm still really struck by what an amazing combination it is. And as Luke says, uh, when I showed him this image for the first time, he, Luke, who edited this series, of course, said, um, it's like when you take your goth friend to a normal bar. That's La Parker. Look at him carrying his chair off there, the little scamp. Kurt Hennig is teaming with the Harris brothers tonight in six-man tag team action, except one second, they are not the Harris brothers. At this moment in time, they are known as Patrick and Gerald, a pretty overt shot at WWF. Papa Asen and, and Gerald Bresco. Take that, Vince. McMahon, not Russo. Those three guys are taking on the Harlem Heat, Booker T and Stevie Ray, and Midnight. But there's trouble in the babyface ranks as Stevie Ray walks out of a backstage interview because he's not happy with this Midnight woman showing up and she's driving a wedge between him and his brother. And Booker's like, no, Midnight's okay, man. And Stevie's like, I'm off. See you later. It's going to be a handicap match now because it's just you two against three of them. He doesn't say that. That's me doing exposition. Everyone makes their entrance. Midnight's entrance is interesting. The lights go down, and when they come back up, she's suddenly in the ring, like The Undertaker or like The House of Black or something. But her gimmick is just not supernatural or spooky in the slightest. She's a big, strong bodybuilder woman. The heels obviously dominate this match because it's three on two. Actually, it's more like four on two because Virgil keeps getting on the apron and causing distractions and that sort of thing. But the thing that I keep thinking is, where's the Parker? Because he was part of this gang as well, and he just doesn't show up for the rest of the pay-per-view. It's actually a disgrace is what it is. Finally, as you can see here, Stevie Ray has a change of heart and comes back to the ring. But Booker T is like, no, mate, you walked out on us. Get, we don't need your help now. Get out. Turns out they do need his help because Kurt Hennig loads up his fist, drills Booker with it, and the heels get the win. I don't know what the weapon is. We see a glimpse of it when he gets out of the ring and hides behind the apron. Just a white ring. Looks like a polo mint or like a giant polo. That's what, yeah, why not? That's what it is. It's a giant polo. Do they even have polo mints if you're watching this from outside of the UK? Do you have polos? Is that what? Do you have mints? Am I into, do you have mints? <laughs> I'm losing my mind. The bad guys obviously win, and this will be the beginning of the end for Harlem Heat. Uh, Stevie would split and start his own version of the Harlem Heat with strippers and cooking, um, with Ahmed Johnson. Next up, it's time for Dustin Rhodes. Mercifully, by the time of Starcade 99, he had ditched the Seven gimmick, the infamous gimmick of Seven, this creepy character who looks through kids' bedroom windows and stuff. Instead, he's Dustin Rhodes once again, and he's like kind of an anti-authoritarian. He's like, you stuck me with that crap gimmick, now I'm myself again, and come on, I'm Dustin Rhodes, baby. He's been feuding with Jeff Jarrett, who has insulted the Rhodes family name. So now, of course, because they're from the South, they're gonna have a bunkhouse brawl. Jarrett jumps Dustin backstage to start this match and they brawl all the way down to the ring. And honestly, it's a messy one. I'm a fan of both guys, but like there's a wheelbarrow. They're kind of going, like they've got each other. <laughs> they've got each other in the wheelbarrow and they're sloppily falling out of it and trying to brawl with each other. It's, it's messy. I guess it seems a bit more real though because of it. Maybe it's because it's his family's signature stipulation, but Dustin really has the edge in this one. Like he beats Jarrett up in the ring. He beats him up out of the ring. He beats him up on the announce table. He beats him up with the bull rope. He throws powder in his eyes. He whips him with his belt. Then he duct tapes the referee to the corner of the ring, which is one that I wasn't expecting, to be honest. The ref's selling it too, like as Dustin's taping him, he's like, Dustin, no, let me go, Dustin, help me. Dustin tapes his mouth shut, so comedy. 
The match continues when, of course, Kurt Hennig, who we now know is working for the powers that be, uh, he comes out and he unduct tapes the referee. He frees him from the corner. While on commentary, Tony Schiavone makes the point that, you know what, whether you like them or not, the powers that be, they do respect the referee's decision and they are consistent, which is maybe the biggest lie in the history of WCW. Now that Hennig's at ringside, he just starts ruining the match. Like, Dustin's had Jarrett beat about four times and Hennig starts breaking up pinfalls, pulling out the referee, until eventually Dustin gets sick of this and just kicks him in the balls. Yeah. The three wrestlers brawl up the ramp and in a finish that I can only imagine Jarrett wrote himself in his e-fed to make himself look super cool, he jumps off a ladder with a guitar shot to Dustin for the win. But it's not actually as cool as it sounds. It's more like... Boom. Yeah, there we go. Next up, crowbar on a pole where it just keeps rising. Backstage we go where David Flair is creepily, he's in like creepy mode at this point in time, he's creepily using a stuffed toy to polish that golden crowbar that he was gifted earlier in the night. He's giving me vibes of Stan from the music video for Stan by Eminem, although this would have come out before that, so maybe Eminem was watching this and got a few ideas, eh Marshall? DDP does an interview before this match. Oh, David Flair's wrestling DDP, by the way, in this crowbar and a pole match. DDP does an interview with Mean Gene where he says, look, David Flair's disgusting and he's been stalking my wife. And I'm like, oh, DDP, that is not on. DDP would never stalk someone's wife two years later. DDP makes his entrance and is attacked before the bell from behind by David Flair with that golden crowbar. Golden crowbar. Uh, oh man, that was a that was a relatively modern day Limp Bizkit reference there. DDP's down and out. They are about to announce that he cannot compete in this match when DDP bravely attacks the ring announcer to stop him from saying that. The match commences. Uh, David Flair gets the better of it because he's already weakened DDP with the golden crowbar. Uh, he thinks about going for the crowbar on the pole and I'm like, just continue using the crowbar you've already been using to win this match. David actually doesn't go for the crowbar to be fair. He listens to me. Instead applies the figure four, but DDP gets out of it. So then David goes back up gets the crowbar from the pole this time and walks straight into a diamond cutter and that's the win for DDP. It's brilliant. It's brilliant drama at the wrestling. DDP afterwards beats up David some more until a debuting Daphne runs out and shields David and DDP's like, oh, and begrudgingly leaves and Daphne laughs at him because she's like, crazy character. So fair enough, good way of getting Daphne involved, I guess that is one positive that comes out of an otherwise awful wrestling match. Next up, we have a proper grudge match with history behind it. It's Lex Luger versus Sting. Sorry, the total package versus Sting because the old Lex Luger is gone and he's renamed himself... <laughs> he's named himself The Total Package. So it's now The Total Package versus Sting. Willies, you know, we're all thinking it. Obviously, Sting and Luger... Um, Sting and Package, old friends, old foes as well, but now Package has been treating Miss Elizabeth poorly, so Sting's trying to free her from her managerial contract with Package. So this match, if Sting wins, then Elizabeth works for him instead. Before the match, Liz is carrying a bottle of pepper spray in case she needs to use it, but Sting goes, no, no, throw that one away. Take my special pepper spray instead in a bigger bottle because in the words of Sting, it's the super high octane stuff. And Liz is like, okay, well, fair enough. Package jumps Sting at the bell and just starts taking him apart until because it's Sting, he starts stinging up and doing all his moves. And Sting's, I mean, Sting's still over. He's one of the few bright points here. Both men knock each other down. They're both down and out in the ring. Liz gets in the ring and crawls over to check on Package, not Sting. This has been a ruse all along. She's gonna turn on Sting. He's been turned on so many times before. Sting stands over her and goes, what are you doing? Liz sprays him with the super high octane pepper spray, but Sting saw this coming. And Liz sprays him with what she thinks is pepper spray, but is actually just silly string. Sting's got one over on you. And now I have a good feeling that he's definitely gonna come out on top here. It's kind of cool, to be honest, because, you know, as, as many of us already know, Sting's whole history of being a good guy has featured him getting betrayed by multiple allies. So it's good that for once, he actually saw this one coming. Sting continues to kick Luger's uh, package's ass. Uh, he sets him up for the Scorpion Deathlock, but then Liz gets back in with the baseball bat. She's about to hit Sting with it. He turns around, he goes, put that baseball bat down, Elizabeth. Then he turns back around, reapplies the Scorpion Deathlock. He's turned his back on Elizabeth, who obviously just picks up the bat and hits him with it anyway. So Sting's still stupid, 
It's a DQ, so Sting's, Sting's won the match, but has he really won? Because they pilmanize his arm and just stomp on the chair around his wrist again and again and again, and Sting's not even selling it because he's totally unconscious from that bat shot. And it's just quite a sad scene, and I'm like, well done, Sting, you've saved the day again. Yo, do, 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 do. Wolfpack is back, causing mad. It's time for Kevin Nash, baby. Yeah, it's time for like some of the featured matches of the card with some huge names like Big Kevin Nash. Uh, while this show may have started out a little bit like WCW TV episodes with undercard matches, tag team stuff, multi man action, now we're getting into WCW pay per view style stuff because this is a WCW pay per view. This is a bad thing because it actually means the show's getting worse. To illustrate this point quite handily, it's time for the master of the power bomb match between Nash and Sid. Uh, this is a feud because they're both big, strong guys. And also, I think it might be the feud where Sid says the infamous line, you are half the man I am and I have half the brain you have, which is one of the most hilarious promo flubs in wrestling history. The rules of this one are simple. It's master of the powerbomb, guys. So the first one to hit a powerbomb wins. Sid goes for one early on, Nash just punches him in the cock. Now after that spot, the match kind of develops into a slow and plodding one, and I'm quite shocked because I was expecting Osprey versus Ricochet style, but instead of that, we get shenanigans. The ref gets bumped by accident, and this means that he misses Sid win the match effectively. He hits a powerbomb on Kevin Nash, just. It's almost as scary as Medusa's one on Evan Courageous from earlier, but Sid kind of rescues it and manages to drop Nash on his back. But for a second, it looked bad. But because the ref's down, he doesn't see the powerbomb, the match continues and Jeff Jarrett runs out to interfere. You'll never guess what he does, right? He actually smashes a guitar over Sid. I know, crazy. Uh, then he takes the time to sweep the guitar shards with his feet out of the ring. That is the attention to detail I love to see in my professional wrestling. And also, I think a crucial reason why Jeff Jarrett is still going strong in AEW some 34 years after his pro wrestling debut. It's actually 36 years. I've just read my notes there, it's 36. But I didn't want to, it was quite a long take and I didn't want to redo it. Nash is therefore back on top. Why is Jarrett working with Nash? We'll find out later on, don't worry about that. Uh, Nash goes to powerbomb Sid, but his back's too sore and he can't get Sid up. So uh, he just wakes up the ref and goes, yeah, I powerbombed Sid, yeah. And the ref goes, oh, you, power oh, you powerbombed Sid? Oh, Nash wins the match. I'm like, what? You <laughs> what? Yeah, Nash wins, right, just to reiterate, Nash wins the match because he tells the referee that he powerbombed Sid and the ref just believes him. It's one of the worst match finishes I've ever seen. Uh, that's no exaggeration. So let's move on very quickly to the penultimate match of the night. Here comes Chris Benoit for that open challenge for his US title. Let's forget about the Nash stuff. Let's just leave that in the past, man. Who is gonna answer Benoit's open challenge? This is a ladder match, by the way, for the US title as well, so it better be somebody nimble. Ooh, it's Jeff Jarrett again, actually. Like, there's been so much Jarrett on this show. Mad respect to him, though, for pulling double duty and all that sort of stuff, but... Man, WCW really is Jeff Jarrett. Now, somewhat predictably, because they're both good wrestlers, this is this is the best match on the card. It's a it's a good match, man. It's a great match. They they fight without the ladder, they fight with the ladder, it's real and intense and it feels urgent. Benoit gets his nose busted open, but it kind of adds to the drama as well. They do some innovative stuff with the ladder. It's just a good match. I I, I can't think of anything witty to say about it. It's just good, man. There's also a spot that I don't think I've ever seen before where uh, Jarrett gets Benoit caught in the rungs of the ladder in the corner and then Jarrett uses the ladder to do almost like a, a Russian leg sweep with Benoit caught in the ladder and it lands on it. That's really cool as well. Eventually Benoit gets on top and he climbs to get the belt but then Jarrett leaps from the top rope and drop kicks the ladder perfectly out from under him. It, it's a spot that could have gone wrong in like 20 different ways, but it doesn't, they nail it. And Benoit's bump from the, near the top of the ladder all the way down to the canvas is also done really well. It's probably the best spot of the entire night. Benoit finally gets the win after a diving headbutt from the ladder and then climbing back up to get the belt. He is now kind of legitimized as champion because he's had this hard fought match with Jarrett. And the crowd responds to this. They pop massively for him, even though they really weren't feeling him during his in-ring promo earlier on in the night. Now they're fully on board. It's almost like really good wrestling matches can encourage a crowd to get behind behind somebody more than constant screwy finishes and clever worky shoot booking all the time. Almost, but that's, that's just my opinion, I guess. And finally, all that's left is the main event of the night. And on paper, you can't argue with the fact that it's a big one. It's Brett the Hitman Hart 
defending the WCW title against Bill Goldberg. This is Babyface versus Babyface. Goldberg's like Mr. WCW, of course. Brett's Brett's Mr. WWF, <laughs> really, isn't he, when you think about it? Um, and, and a lot of people might be wondering, hang on, Brett jumped ship after the screw job in WWF, he jumped ship to WCW. They have now got the what may be the hottest name in Vince's promotion. Now they've got him and he's annoyed at his previous employer and he's gonna be full of fire. Strap a rocket to him, put the belt on him. What how did WCW not win this war already? It should have been the hottest story ever. And it wasn't because WCW kind of didn't know what to do with Bret Hart. Like they turned him heel, they turned him face, they had him kind of affiliated with the NWO, but then also not affiliated with the NWO. They didn't know what they were doing with him, and rather than just make him a hero, they weighed him down with weird booking decisions and nonsensical storyline. Kind of basically what happened to everyone else in the WCW roster as well. I guess being Bret Hart doesn't exclude you from that. So now, a couple of years after debuting in WCW for the first time, they have finally, finally made Bret Hart the champion. But obviously he's lost quite a lot of momentum by this point, so hopefully he can regain a bit of it with this first pay-per-view title defense against Goldberg. It's a big match. It's hard to tell who's gonna win, in fact. Michael Buffer is there for the big introductory ring announcements, and not only does he announce the people in the match, he also says that this is the match that will determine who will lead the company forward into the new millennium. Given the booking decisions that we're about to look at in this match, just keep that in mind. Also, Luke, I don't know if you can put a shot maybe for everybody of Goldberg at the start of this match or during his entrance or maybe when he's waiting in the corner. Look at his head, man. He's definitely headbutted the locker room door again, hasn't he? Bill, stop doing that. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't make you wrestle well. The story of this match is technical prowess versus raw strength and power, which is really evident early on when Brett goes for the sharpshooter, but Goldberg just kicks him off and Brett falls over. Now we get a ref bump, so Charles Robinson runs out as the replacement ref, but then a few minutes later, he gets bumped as well. Goldberg misses a spear and runs into the ring post in the corner, so Brett goes around the outside and locks in his figure four around the ring post, a, a move that he later said Goldberg hurt him on because he didn't really catch his leg properly when Brett went to lock in the figure four, so Brett's head smacked the mat on the outside. That's according to Brett anyway. It, to be fair, watching it, it does hit that mat pretty hard. But that is not the spot this match is most remembered for. That happens when a third ref comes out, he gets bumped as well, what's with all these ref bumps? And then moments later, Brett takes the kick from Goldberg that would ultimately give him the concussion that would go on to end his career. Honestly, in real time, the spot actually looks class. Like it looks really, really good. Brett seems to take the bump well, Goldberg does the kick well and everything. But there's an angle which I don't think they show on this broadcast, but I've seen it before. It's the angle from behind Goldberg's head where you see the kick and you see it proper full on hit Brett in the face. And the first time I saw that angle, I was like, oh wow, I can see why this gave him a concussion. Goldberg waits for Brett to get up, nails him with the spear, but there's no referee. He looks towards the ramp and here comes Rowdy Roddy Piper as the new referee. Goldberg's distracted by this. He's like, Roddy, what are you doing here? And while he's distracted, Brett chop blocks him from behind, locks in the sharpshooter, and Roddy Piper calls for the bell. They've <laughs> They've done a rehash of the Montreal screw job. We all love angles like that, don't we? Goldberg and Brett even look all confused, like Goldberg's playing the role of Brett and Brett's playing the role of Sean, I guess, and Roddy Zell Hebner, but he doesn't run away. He saunters reluctantly up the ramp with the belt as well. Roddy's got the belt. And then Brett chases him up the ramp and meets him at the top and goes, what the hell, Roddy? And Roddy just gives him the belt and walks off. And that's how the biggest pay-per-view of WCW's calendar year ends with a confused Bret Hart, still the champion, after Goldberg was screwed and he's just stood there. Uh, it's just, it's an awkward ending. Merry Christmas, everyone. That's how, that's how we sent the WCW fans off to the festive period and yeah. Now, if you've not heard of the Montreal Screwjob, first of all, how? But secondly, if you haven't, great news. We've got a complete guide to it on this channel called Screwed, the complete story of the Montreal Screwjob. Sam Driver spent a lot of time on it, so do check it out. But obviously, aside from that, a few things need explaining here. Number one, why did Piper look so sad about screwing Goldberg? Well, that's because he was in a feud at the time with the powers that be, and it was implied that Russo had basically made him screw Goldberg. So I guess that checks out. 
It's not good, but it checks out. Number two, what did Bret Hart do next? Because he certainly didn't look very happy. He didn't look like he was in on the plan. Well, the next night on Nitro, Brett vacated the belt and then had a rematch with Goldberg saying in an honorable way, like, no, that wasn't real. Bill, you deserve a rematch with me and we can decide who the real champion is, fair and square. In that match, Brett went again with the help of Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and Jeff Jarrett. Brett turned heel and with those guys, he formed NWO 2000. That was as bad as it sounds. Uh, also, what happened with Brett's injury? Well, Brett was legitimately concussed in this Starcade match and forfeited the belt because of this a few weeks later on and would even retire from wrestling later on in the year 2000. The vacant belt would be won by Chris Benoit at the next pay-per-view sold out. He would be stripped of the title one day later after falling out with WCW and leaving for the WWF. So not a good chain of events for WCW and not a good chain of events for me and you because we've all wasted our time looking at one of the weirdest WCW pay-per-views of all time. But there's a lot to choose from. What would you like to see me cover next? Doesn't have to be WCW. It can be whatever your heart's desire. Leave your suggestions in that comment section down below. And thank you very much for watching this video. I've been Jack from Cultaholic. I do hope you've enjoyed yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Have a good one.